there and welcome to another Three Wide Life. Today we have reigning World of Outlaw champion Donnie Schatz after an amazing year in the World of Outlaw Wing Sprint Car Series. He had 26 wins en route to his sixth career title. He currently sits second on the championship list behind retired Steve Kinzer and has obviously put himself in the dirt history books as one of the best ever to drive a wing sprint car. Today, Natalie Sather sits down with Donnie to talk about his amazing season. But first, let's find out how Donnie began his career and what sacrifices he and his family had to make before they could begin this awesome journey. Donnie, we're sitting here at the dirt track where so many times you've been crowned the World of Outlaw champion. But I want to go back to where it all began in 1993 when you climbed behind a sprint car for the very first time in Missouri. Describe what it was like to get behind such a high-powered vehicle for the first time. Uh, it's crazy. Um, you know, coming out of go-karts, um, I had driven a sprint car before, but you just, you know, when you're on the track by yourself, you really don't think of anything else. You're not worried about crashing. You're not worried that it's racing is a whole other story. When you get on the racetrack with other people, your first intuition is worried about, you know, man, I'm going to take someone else out or I'm going to run into someone or cause a, cause a crash, um, all of that. But it's, uh, it's something that took me quite a while to get um, comfortable. Some days I don't know if I ever am comfortable with some of the conditions, but it's, uh, it's unbelievable. Um, the power, uh, what the tires do, you know, the, the you expect them to stick in this scenario and they don't, and the scenarios um, where you think they wouldn't stick and they do. Uh, back then they did a lot of wheelies, you know, we don't see that anymore. Uh, just crazy things and what that wing does uh, to make the car turn the corner and go fast down the straightaway and all the things it does is uh, it's it's definitely probably one of the most unique feelings that you could ever as a driver of any vehicle um, get in and drive. You were just 15 when you started out and at that time tracks you had to be 16 in order to race. How did you guys get around that that rule? <laughs> um, there wasn't some tracks had rules some tracks didn't um, I think the first time I raced, you said it's uh, State Fair Speedway at Sedalia, um, there really wasn't a rule. Uh, you know, we might have fibbed about my age because we read more into the age thing than what it was. But uh, the next night we went to Jefferson City, Missouri, and uh, they were NASCAR sanctioned. You had to apply for a license and uh, did fib about my age a little bit. And they caught me, but it was a week after I raced, so I wasn't <laughs> allowed to come back there. And I honestly haven't been back there yeah. since. But, uh, you know, that's a, it's a slippery slope. It's something I think a lot of parents probably have fudged a little bit on the age, but uh, no harm, no foul. You continued racing throughout the Midwest, and in 1996, you went and tried out for your first Kings Royal, made the show, and finished eighth, and you've actually won there two times since then. What was it like being so young, racing against some of the, your heroes and qualifying for your first ever Kings Royal? Um, you know, those are guys that you grew up watching on TV back uh, when they had the Winter Series on television in Phoenix. And, um, you know, that's what your highlight was on Sunday nights is, man, I get to watch Steve and Sammy and, and all these guys. And here you are at the same facility, Eldora of all places, one of the most intimidating places uh, to go when you're that young and, and race. And um, it was so surreal, you know, I did have great help. Uh, the guy that went with me had been racing with a professional outlaw team a lot of times and and uh, you know his expertise got the car great and I was just got in great spots all night long to get in the show and run in the top 10 so um, you know to me it was a, a big confidence builder it was, it was huge to be a part of um, enjoyed being there but uh, man scary is uh, not even the correct word to say it's uh, I don't know that there is a word you could say I was scared to death because that's just one night is as many emotions, as much um, passion as you put into one night, you knew you were going to go try and do it for 100 nights. And it, it took its, uh, I knew it was going to take its toll on me, so I was going to have to find a way to deal with that. And um, man, it's been, it's been a lot of fun ever since. The next year, 97, you began your first year on the World of Outlaw Tour. What was that like at 19, knowing you're going to be traveling all over the country, and like you just said, with these guys, it's intimidating. and being able to do that at such a young age? Well, if you're gonna do it, doing it at a young age is great. But you know, that's, you're out of high school, you're at a point in your life where it's, it's do or die. You, you don't wanna be a failure in life. I mean, it's something that, um, you know, you have the desire yourself to get out and work hard. And uh, I was setting my path down a, a direction that, you know, was unsure of. Am I good enough to do this? No, 
not even close. Can I be? Yes. Uh, I'm going to have to work at it. And, and I got to having a lot of fun, uh, probably uh, a little too much fun sometimes <laughs> and got too wrapped up in the moment. But there, co there comes a point when you're that young, you have to grow up and you have to realize, man, is this really what I want to do? Because I'm just, I'm here. I, I want to be more than here. I just, I want to win races. I want to be a factor here. I want to be on top of this. So, you know, all these things and it's no easy task. It's not something that one year or two years or um, one race is going to fix. It's something that takes a lot of, a lot of laps, a lot of time and a lot of dedication. So uh, I was very fortunate in that department to have that go my way. With 88 races across all of North America, the world of outlaw schedule is tough to say the least. So how did all that travel affect Donnie as he was growing up and finding himself as a top level competitor? You talk about, you know, being on the road and you, you know, you had too much fun and do you think being on the road that young helped you grow up a lot quicker? Oh no, it didn't help me grow up. It helped me uh, stay young a lot longer, I can <laughs> tell you that. Um, what helps you grow up is, is the fact that you're here and you're not in the place you want to be while you're here. Um, you know, you don't want to be a 10th place car. You don't want to be a fifth place car. You want to be a, a champion. You want to be a winner. Um, you, want to, you want to do things that people leave the racetrack at the end of the night saying, man, that was unbelievable. Um, you know, never been, I've never been one that worried about, uh, you know, what people say about you. It's if they're not talking about you, whether it's good or bad is when you got to worry. So that's what helped me grow up, wanting to be in that position, wanting to work hard, wanting to learn to drive the way that I needed to, to win races, to win the nationals, to win all the things that we've done. And um, I, I can tell you that the fun that we used to have out here 15 years ago, definitely, um, you're going to go through the fun stage of your life at some point. I guess the younger days is when it's, if you don't do it then, you're going to do it later in life. And I did it when I was younger, so I'm, I'm very fortunate there. But uh, a lot of them things helped me grow up too. So uh, I can't, I'd, I wouldn't change any of it for anything. Your first win came a year after on the Tour 98 at Cottage Grove. What was it like to get your first World of Outlaw win? And how is it going back to that track? Does it have so much special memory to you? Oh, absolutely. Cottage Grove, Oregon, it's, um, it does. I, I distinctly remember that night, um, you know, S Steve and Sammy were racing for the, for the lead and they were bouncing off each other and they were uh, the typical Steve and Sammy battle. I mean, they were going at each other about as fierce as two competitors uh, did go at each other and, and there was always maybe a little contact or, but that's, it, it's some sort of things that ex made those guys excel. And I was running third and I was hanging right with them and they're doing all this and they just kept getting faster. And I'm like, oh, I, gotta, I gotta do something <laughs> yeah. to get, and I stayed with them and I stayed with them and I finally, got to a point where, man, they made a mistake and I was there to capitalize on it. You talk about that battle with Steve and Sammy. What was it like being able to grow up racing against these two guys? And you know, Steve, this is his last year and Sammy retired and now you don't get to race against him anymore. Well, that's not something that, that you ever thought you wanted to think about, you know, but it's the reality that's here. Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have been able to learn a lot from those guys and race with those guys. And you come out here at a young age, um, you learn to earn their respect by the way you race them and the way you race with them. And that's something that um, I take great pride in. You know, I consider both of them great friends and I know that um, we can all race together and, and respect each other that same way. In today's world, you don't really earn respect anymore. You know, it's kind of demanded and, and people just expect it. So things are a little bit different than they were back then, but you know, I consider what they've done uh, even I'm on the tail end of that old school cool part. And that's something that uh, not a lot of people understand, the, the old school part, but um, so many of them guys that have been out here for so long just learn so many ways and go to all the, it's, you just make it your nature, you know? And, and I've tried to do that same thing. So um, I enjoy that. Like I said, I wouldn't change the way I did anything for the world. Um, it's the way I did it. Uh, I learned from the mistakes that I made uh, I learned from the mistakes some of them made, and um, it is what it is. We're here today and enjoying every minute of it. Old school World of Outlaw drivers were seen as rough and very hardcore. New school drivers are more exact and into the technology behind the race car. So how does Donnie define himself? Is he old school or new school? You kind of came along when it was just perfect time. I would call you old school, new school. That's how I would describe you. 
Well, in 2005, Ricky Warner, who is your now crew chief, you joined forces with him. And that year, you guys ran second at the Knoxville Nationals, and you had seven win and won the National Open at Williams Grove. What was it about Ricky Warner that you guys clicked so well right off the bat? Well, uh, I had been racing for a long time, and I felt like I was at the point where, uh, you know, I, I maybe was lacking in the way we were setting the cars up. And, and the thing about this sport is you always think that there's uh, a better piece of this and a better piece of that. And uh, you get to the point where you learn that that's not the case. You take what you have and, and you work with it. And if you work hard enough at it and with it, you're going to you're going to get it where you want it to be for yourself, not necessarily some guy buying it down the line or anybody else, but it suits you. And when Rick came, the way he attacks things and the way he thinks about things, me and him were able to get onto things that, that were good for me and uh, correlate the way that he wanted them done and I wanted them done. And I think we're probably equally alike. We have, uh, we have our ditzy moments and we have our moments where we both know what the other one's thinking before we even react to, to what's happening. So, um, you know, we've just been a great fit. We've uh, not had the greatest communication, but, but that's something that, that you learn when you don't communicate on something or you're not good at something, you have to work at it to fix it. And we did, you know, we worked on the things we needed to work on and um, I learned how to tune out the things that I didn't need to, to worry about. And uh, we've just had a great relationship um, we do things away from the racing that, that we both enjoy and, and we've enjoyed each other. Uh, believe me, we've had many of fights along <laughs> the way, but I think it, it goes without saying that if you find somebody in this sport that doesn't get upset and doesn't get mad, I will show you someone that I can beat every day. And that's how both of us are. If we're not where we want to be, we're not happy. I'm not going to put a smiley face on and say, hey, I'm happy even though I'm not. I'm just not phony like that and Rick's the same way. So uh, you take two people like that that uh, have the determination, uh, it's a great fit. I hope, uh, you know, I hope it's something that we both can continue to drive each other to keep, keep getting better. With all that success, you grabbed the attention of car owner Tony Stewart. Now for many reasons, Tony's not your typical car owner and then he also races. Was that more intimidating, having somebody that has raced as well with so much success as a car owner? No, I don't think, um, that's intimidating at all because your expectations for yourself are to be put yourself in them shoes and we've done that with our own team driving for someone else was something that was totally new to me versus having your own team I mean uh, there it has its glitches with having its own team I mean my dad fired me a lot of nights but my mom <laughs> rehired me the minute she found out I got fired so you know it's uh, having a family thing is, is is a lot of fun just for that reason you know there's a lot of guys that uh, when they're that young to get in a car, a high profile ride and car like what one of Tony's, um, it'll break you more than it can make you because you're expect you have to be um, Johnny on the spot. You got to be producing right now. And um, if you're too young, sometimes it can break you. Uh, I was at that age where I was, you know, really ready to, to do that and, and make sure it fit for me. And um, having Tony as a boss, from the word go, he said that our motto is to hire the people we want and let them do their jobs and that's what he's done the entire time I've been there he has he's hired me to do what he wants me to do he knows that we're capable of doing it and he doesn't have uh, anything he doesn't stop us in any way on what we do there's times when you do need a kick in the butt you need to get your butt straightened out and that's what your boss is for and he does do that so and he does pat you on the back too do you think running your parents car, your family owned car for 15 years prior to racing for Tony helped prepare you for everything with racing for his organization? No question. There's no question that it, it put me in the position I'm in today. Um, you know, it's it's a lot of fun to, to be racing with your family, but like I said, I, I was fired a lot of times from my father because he didn't think I was doing the job, but I was able to maintain because my mom put the stop to it. And that, that might be funny, but it's, uh, it's the reality of it. That's exactly the way it worked. And, uh, my dad's been one there from the word go that um, if I needed a kick in the butt, I got it. And, and that's, I wouldn't want it any other way. I mean, I don't want someone to tell me, um, hey, you're doing a great job when you're not doing a great job. It's, it's false sense of security. And this is not a place where you want false sense of security at all. With 26 wins, obviously the 2014 season was successful. But what have the emotions been like behind this awesome performance and championship? 
This year has been such an emotional year, I feel like, for you. In Grand Forks, as a track where you grew up this year, you tied your hero, Mark Kinzer, with 154 wins. And I saw you get you know, teary-eyed, and I actually even saw your mom crying. How, what did that mean to you and your entire family to be able to tie your hero, Mark Kinzer? Well, Mark was someone who did a lot for me, you know, being out here. Um, nowadays, you don't, there isn't someone that'll take you under their wing and, and you can be their friend, you travel with them. Um, but Mark was, Mark, I, I looked up to him a lot. And then when I did that, Mark was, he was the man. He was out here winning 30 races a year, whatever he won. And um, he was the guy that you, you wanted to be because he was on the top of the hill. So I learned a lot from him. And, and uh, you know, when you get to people like Doug Wolfgang on the win list, and uh, he was a childhood hero. And Mark was someone that I could relate to because I raced with him and I was a friend of his. You get to that point, it's kind of surreal. You're like, wow, uh, someone that I looked up to and I, and I know how big I, I looked at them like they were up here. And now I'm in a position to, to better that. And it's, uh, it's crazy. Uh, it's, not a, it's not an emotion that you can really explain, but um, it's, it's something I'll never, uh, never forget and probably never forget feeling. Many fans don't get to see the emotional side of you and and you know you have your fans you have your critics but describe to them how much this means to you and how much hard work and travel and you know blood sweat and tears you put into these last seasons to now be sitting here as a six-time world of outlaw champion well it's it's uh it's like i said earlier with when you're not good at something all you can do is work at it to try to get yourself better and try to be in the position uh that you want to be in and I've never been one that's been probably the most fan favorite or the most outgoing with fans because when I when I get my helmet on or I'm in the position I want to be in, that's that's my focus. I never try to avoid people. Um, I know there's uh, you, you have flaws, um, but I can acknowledge my flaws and work on them. Um, that's that's all you do. You know, there's we deal with government every day, they can't acknowledge a flaw. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll sit here and admit, there's I'm, I'm terrible at a lot of things because my mind's going 500 miles an hour and I probably should be going 80 when I'm not in the car. But um, you do your best with it and you learn from your mistakes and I've made a lot of them. So you, you just try to rectify it. Um, you know, in this sport, it's, in, a, in the last several years, you've seen it become more the entertainment side of things. and. To me, that's kind of disheartening because this is really the race and being able to race with these guys that are that are now leaving the sport. Steve Kinzer, Sammy Swindell, Doug Wolfgang's gone, Mark Kinzer's gone. The, the level of competition that they put here and brought here and allowed us to, to race and be a part of this world of outlaws is what's brought me here. Not because I went to the races and saw somebody fight <laughs> yeah. or I saw somebody flip or I saw a car explode or on fire. And that's, that's the part that uh, wears on you, you know. These teams, uh, the money that's spent, the, the work they put in, man, they, they're thinking about one thing. They're here for the competition and the winning. And sometimes that gets sidelined and not to be the total focus. So uh, you have to balance. I, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a very hard balance, but you know, I'm working on it. I've never been one that's been big on social media. Every year, there are new drivers entering into the World of Outlaw series to try their hand against drivers just like Donnie Schatz. So does Donnie give them any advice to help ease the transition? What advice would you give to a young driver coming up in the series now? <laughs> you could probably sit down with a young driver and talk to him for eight hours and tell him all these things. And the, the thing is, is you can only learn from your own mistakes. I could tell somebody something, but just because I tell them doesn't mean they're going to believe it or they're going to think this is magic. You have to experience it. And I learned that from Kenny Woodruff. I thought everything had to be the magic setup, had to be magic this. And, and even though he had 110% confidence in me when I drove his car, he never let me know that. <laughs> yeah. I felt like I had to prove myself to him. But really, I had to prove myself to myself, and that's what he taught me. So, you know, that's, uh, it's a big lesson. And I guess more than anything, you don't, you, you can tell someone, don't do it for anybody else other than yourself. Don't do it to try to impress a NASCAR owner. Don't do it to try to impress this person in the stands. Do it for you. 
that's what that's what this is about and um, that's probably the best advice I can give anybody that's good advice not only for a driver but anybody you know working hard for a career but we want to thank you Donnie very much for your time and congratulate you on a six-pack six-time Road of Atla champion thanks Donnie thanks Natalie That's it for another Three Wide Life. Thank you so much to Donnie Schatz and the World of Outlaws series for allowing us to sit down with Donnie and learn more about his amazing season. Until next time, make sure you're checking out our Twitter, our Facebook, our Instagram, and our website where we're constantly updating with cool behind the scenes and from the track content. And until your next race, keep living the Three Wide Life. Mm.